silence and direct you to Hebrews chapter 11, verse 13. Daylight Savings Time has granted me the glare in the uh, <laughs> parking lot. <laughs> we will read down through verse 16. These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Let's um, look to the Lord as we start. Fathers, we consider your presence with us this morning with the assurance that we are heavenly citizens, that you have made us citizens of your kingdom already, and that we enjoy many blessings and benefits uh, accordingly. We know that ahead is a wondrous, wonderful future where we will come apart from sin and live in an environment forever free of injustice, unrighteousness, ungodliness. And for now, Father, we lean heavily on your grace. Uh, We look to you and your sovereignty and understand your total control, even in times of great distress. And we thank you for the time we can have together as a body considering your word this morning. We ask that you bless our time in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, uh, it was an eventful trip in a number of ways, Uh, and with all the travel trials, I'm happy to report that everyone is now safely home. Some are, Mark and Ruth are at home nursing some ailments that might be travel related, not sure. I know Liz has been dealing with something that she picked up before she left, so we're we're home but not fully recovered, I guess we could put it that way. Uh, And for those that might not have known that Hillary made it back, she actually made it back um, Friday, I was it Friday? Saturday morning. Eh, it was sometime then. She's home. She's home. <laughs> she had her own trials on both ends of her trip too. But anyway, uh, sandwiched in between all the travel issues was a wonderful time, from getting to know Bruna's family to a beautiful wedding and reception, to several pr- picture perfect days that we enjoyed together as a family uh, at a beach resort down there. And I won't take any more time to fill in the gaps. Uh, Perhaps the pastor, who's much more familiar with the travel side of things on their end, might fill some of those in. Um, But anyway, uh, you know that there's a reception that we're going to have in a couple weeks for David and Bruna. I think it's uh, Saturday. It's a busy weekend, but because of their travel, we had to squeeze it in somewhere. So 2 o'clock on Saturday... It's in, it's in the bulletin, right? Uh, we'll put together a presentation of some sort, and you'll see some pictures in addition to being able to spend time with them. But uh, we'll get back into our study now. But before we get back to a look at true spirituality, I'd like to address something that may still be weighing on many of our hearts. On Tuesday night, I stayed up watching the election returns on CNN, which is the only station that, that they had in English where we were. Yeah, it was three hours later in Brazil, so it was a very late night, but I'm a political junkie, as it were, anyway. Uh, and I was the canary in the coal mine, it turns out, for the family, so the next, the next morning I could give them all the lowdown. But uh, it suddenly struck me, as the results became evident rather quickly, that though I was in a foreign country, I would soon be returning to a land that has rapidly become foreign itself. Uh, And then the Hebrews 11 passage that we read came to mind and a great peace came over me. And more on that passage in a minute. Uh, Now this sense of being foreign relates to our nation's departure and decline from its founding values, largely derived from biblical and divine institution principles. Perhaps 
short of Old Testament Israel only, our nation has seen this in a way more than has been the case of any other nation in world history in terms of its founding principles. Uh, though the validation of this transformation away from these principles is clearly represented enough in the re-election of the president, you may not have been aware of several more direct ways in which voters turned aside biblical and divine institution principles on Tuesday. Uh, voters soundly rejected two senatorial candidates in repudiation of pro-life statements that, though they may have been a bit awkward at the time that they stated them, were nonetheless firmly representative of the conviction that every life is God-given. And then there were residents of three states who voted in favor of homosexual marriage, Maryland, Maine, and Washington State. It's the first time that this has happened after 32 failed attempts on the national level or at state level that advocates of homosexual marriage have prevailed. And at the same time, Minnesotans defeated a measure to amend their state constitution establishing marriage as between a man and a woman. And all of this is welcomed and seen as progress under our present former and now future administration. So we have a president who has fulfilled his promise of bringing change to America. We have an electorate who has validated this agenda and asked for at least four more years of the same. And beyond this, we have a population that seems to have a limited understanding and or concern at this point of what America is on the basis of its founding as established, as you know, in several important documents. This administration has been very open about an agenda that essentially dismantles the republic. And our population at large is either in hearty agreement with this, misunderstanding of this, or too apathetic to be counted among those who would vote against this. Now, our founders carefully established our republic on biblical and divine institution principles, but they viewed this more as an experiment than a secure achievement. They were painfully aware that the success of this system depended much more on the responsible choices of sinful men than on the system itself. To attest to this, I dusted off a couple of slides from the War of the Worldview study, and here, for instance, is what Patrick Henry said in 1765. He wrote, Whether this will prove a blessing or a curse will depend upon the use our people make of the blessings which God, a gracious God hath bestowed upon us. If they be wise, they will be great and happy. If they are a, of a contrary character, they will be miserable. Righteousness alone shall exalt them as a nation. Reader, whoever thou art, remember this, and in thy sphere practice virtue thyself and encourage it in others. One hundred years later, uh, speaking along the same, li same lines as he exhorted a minister concerning the importance of teaching biblical truth, John Quincy Adams states in 1860, Statesman, my dear sir, may plan and speculate for liberty, but it is religion and morality alone which can establish the principles upon which freedom can securely stand. The only foundation of a free constitution is pure virtue. And if this cannot be inspired in our people in a greater measure than they have it now, and that's back in 1860, they may change their rulers and the forms of government, but they will not obtain a lasting liberty. They will only exchange tyrants and tyrannies. You cannot, therefore, be more pleasantly or usefully employed than in the way of your profession, pulling down the strongholds of Satan. He looked to the pulpits of America uh, to, to be that safeguard for those very pillars that would support the ongoing nation, which is the experiment called America. Now, I could have quoted... Alexis de Tocqueville's similar comments, as he observed from the outside as a Frenchman and wrote, uh, wrote substantially on the American democracy, where he observed that the strength of America at the time he observed it, again, was founded on its, well, he called it religious heritage or religious uh, practices, but the virtue and righteousness that he saw that was supported by uh, a prevalence of um, 
sound teaching at the time from the pulpits. Now, though beginning some time ago, of course, that's 1860, you had, that was one century, so one century removed, we get to the 1960s, and that seems to be where the cliff, we hit the cliff, or really that curve started really descending. Um, so this began some time ago, but, and though it did begin some time ago, through the cumulative drift of years of incrementally bad choices, we have apparently arrived at a point of irreversibility. Irreversibility. If you are among those, like I have been, who are inclined to pin the hopes of, pres of preserving or reclaiming America's founding values on a political outcome or solution, I think it's time to accept the vanity of this mindset. Now, I don't mean that we abandon civic responsibility, but it's a matter of recognizing that civic, civic responsibility itself has a context, and that as believers, our primary role is evangelistic, not civic. Now, with Charlie Clough's teaching fresh in our minds, this should resonate. While in Brazil, I also finished the book he had recommended, like several of you have, and have, we've, I've had some discussions with others, Conversational Evangelism. In recognition of the degree to which postmodern thinking has overtaken contemporary society, the authors lay out an approach that accounts for the need to lay foundations and establish bridges for the gospel first. This is something that wasn't always as necessary in a country where a biblical framework was essentially common knowledge. And when you read through this, if you are reading, maybe you were struck as I was, that we are in America, a country substantially supporting missions work like New Tribes Missions, and yet we need to use the New Tribes Missions approach in our own country now in reaching our present population. Now, if you were to look at some of the details of the voting percentages, in other words, the numbers behind the numbers, you will find that the political and educational efforts toward dependency and immorality in our country have been very successful, especially relative to gender and age. And it is here that you get a sense of the irreversibility of our condition. There is not a political solution to this. There is not a politician that would win on a national level on a platform of bold, fundamental biblical values. Our country is now foreign to those values that were not only embedded in America's founding, but were commonly accepted in her early years. There was a time when the principle of Psalm 33:12 was widely accepted. Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. Today, government itself has supplanted God. Winning elections has been reduced largely to which candidate or party will give us the most goodies and take care of our needs. The connection between godliness and blessing has been severed. I have a quote uh, that speaks to this, uh, to, the, to the former part of this statement, i.e. the winning of elections is to the, goes to those who promise the most goodies. It is by a Roman poet of the late 1st and early 2nd century, known in English as Juvenal. I put the Latin there in case you wanted to read it in Latin, but just to show that it was a legitimate quote primarily. But we'll read it in the English. Already long ago, from when we sold our vote to no man, the people have abdicated our duties. For the people who once upon a time handed out military command, high civil office, legions, everything, now restrains itself and anxiously hopes for just two things, bread and circuses. Now, the idea is, at the time, was the Roman leaders were securing votes on the basis of what they could hand out by way of food and entertainment, bread and circuses. Now, you could substitute in our age a number of things, any number of things for bread and circuses, that our government presently hands out, from food stamps to cell phones. Uh, but the principle is the same. 
we, a nation, as a nation, we vote on our pocketbook. And even if it's not on handouts, it's on the economy, stupid. Well, it's not the economy, stupid. It's the righteousness, stupid. And so both parties are chasing voters on the basis of economy or pocketbook, and we're missing, we've missed the boat. The boat is sunk. Now on the second point, regarding the connection of godliness and prosperity, clearly, this was clearly understood by the founders. And on that point, neither, as I said, conservatism nor liberalism equals godliness. And we have arrived at a point where any residual concerns about godliness have readily given way to the emerging political concerns about attracting voters on the basis of demographics. That's the new word, demographics. We've got to target the segments of society to attract votes. And then broad-mindedness. We've got to all come to common uh, positions on things that, as a society, we've accepted. What do they include today? Obviously, homosexual marriage. We can't go back anymore on that. That's, that's fixed. It's becoming more fixed. Now, we will not experience conditions where righteousness and justice prevail until starting in the millennium. And this is where, in the face of all this, we can draw great encouragement from our passage here. And let's reread this passage in light of everything that I've said, putting context to it. Verse 13, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is, a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for He has prepared a city for them. We are pilgrims in a foreign land, regardless of our temporal nationality and even the condition of that nation. The presence of sin and the world system under Satan's rulership have rendered our temp temporal home foreign soil. There is a day ahead when in the absence of sin and evil, we will find ourselves not only at home in the land of which we are already citizens, heaven, but we will see our nation itself purified among all nations that according to Revelations 21 shall walk in the light of the heavenly Jerusalem. But in the meantime, as ambassadors of our heavenly home, we are to be primarily occupied with living as credible representatives of Christ and targeting our energies not at Christianizing our temporal home, but at evangelizing individuals that they may themselves become citizens of heaven. And we may find ourselves engaged in many temporal pursuits of necessity, including maybe even politics. I don't want to scare you necessarily from something that God has planted in your heart in that direction. But our primary focus should be on things above and the priorities of God accordingly. Okay, that's the introduction. Now, we'll move on to, uh, in our remaining time, to our Galatians study. Now, here's our, again, our summary outline. We've taken a detour into the topic of true spirituality, making some progress here. I won't go down through the entire outline, but we've spent the last several sessions on the three conditions of spirituality, uh, which are specifically <clears throat> yieldedness to God, confession of sin, and walking in the Spirit. Now, we had wrapped up last time together yieldedness and had just introduced confession. As we've seen, uh, and just reviewing what we've seen in this outline here, the directive of yieldedness is typically associated with the command of 1 Thessalonians 5.19, do not quench the Spirit though it's found in many other passages, directly and indirectly. But this passage leverages the physical image of dousing a flame to denote the quenching of the active influence of the Holy Spirit in one's life. Not the presence, the active influence. Uh, 
as a believer, the Holy Spirit's taken up permanent residence in our hearts. So we're talking about dousing the active influence of the Spirit. Now, based on what we've seen, we may conclude that yieldedness is the foundation of true spirituality, and it is the primary distinguishing factor between the spiritual and the carnal believer. So we, that's an important point because a lot of times the focus is on confession or in terms of an overarching theme relative to spirituality, but it really seems clear that it is yieldedness that is the foundation of true spirituality. And it's the primary distinguishing factor between the spiritual and carnal believer. Now we wrapped up yieldedness last time with a couple of related loose ends. First, the question regarding Romans 12, 1 and 2 of whether presenting oneself refers to a once-for-all act or an act that is to be repeated as necessary. Now we spent considerable time with this that I will not repeat, uh, but without being dogmatic on this point because there is several people on both sides that have done substantial work and are uh, of high reputation in terms of our um, awareness of their work that take either position. Uh, but in looking at this carefully and all that was available in addition to the text and the context, it seems in consideration of most of the relevant factors, including the context and the Greek verb construction, that what Romans 12, 1 and 2 is talking about in terms of presenting oneself is an act that is to be repeated as necessary, perhaps even daily, as you consider the charge uh, to take up your cross daily and follow me. The believer is faced with the constant choice of presenting himself to the Lord or to the flesh. Now, I do think the believer should arrive at the place of a settled, conscious, underlying commitment to the will of God. And I think we can relate to that. The idea is, okay, I'm done goofing around with my life. I want to live for the Lord. I mean, there's a point where you can come to that, that conscious threshold. But I don't think that that is what Romans 12, 1 and 2 can be attributed to. There is no point of conscious commitment that we could make that transcends the need for ongoing choices moment by moment. So again, that's in line with the thought that when Christ directs us to follow him, it's with the notion of take up your cross daily and follow me. That The idea there is not just a one-time take up my cross, your cross and follow me. It's, it's something that has to be re, reaffirmed or, in a, in a sense, um, uh, aligned with daily, which may be a metaphor, as it were, for moment by moment. Then we looked at the reality, the results, and implications of unyieldedness. From Hebrews 3, we noted from the example of the children of Israel that unyieldedness in the life of believers is a real possibility. It is possible that a believer may walk apart from the Lord for any length of time. You know, it could be a, a substantial length of time, a short length of time. And to the extent this occurs, here are some of the results or consequences. We see loss of fellowship. And I've got passages. I'm not going to go through all of these other than just read down the list here. Uh, loss of fellowship. Deliverance into the power of our iniquities. And this is the person that's unyielded, the believer. A passive hardening of the heart. That's not Being unyielded is active, but the passive hardening of the heart is where the Lord comes alongside and says, okay, I will harden your heart. You will, be, you will become hardened in that condition as you have chosen to be in that condition. You become dull of hearing. Of course, that's with respect to spiritual matters, being able to relate to spiritual truth. You, are, you become, if it's an extended or protracted situation, there's a perpetual state of spiritual immaturity. You do not grow spiritually in an unyielded state. Then you can reach a point of loss of assurance. You lose contact or lose the sense of the forgiveness of your sins, which is essentially what the cleansing from your sins. And then 
there's divine discipline. Now, there's specifically uh, uh, imposed divine discipline where God may direct it for a specific failure on the part of the believer. But we, what does Hebrews say here? Is it simply select believers that experience divine discipline? We are all subject to divine discipline. We all experience divine discipline. And it's not, that means it's not related necessarily to acts of unyieldedness, but the tendency in our hearts for unyieldedness that God has to work out of us in various ways to bring, our, bring us face to face with areas of our unyieldedness and then bring us through that. So divine discipline is a consequence for everyone. The others are pretty much a consequence, one through six, for those who are particularly engaged in um, acts of unyieldedness or a posture of unyieldedness. Okay, so let me find out where I was here. Now, as I went over this list again, I was struck by how these consequences apply in whatever way unyieldedness may be manifest. Our particular concern in the study up to this, you know, related to this list has been with the life of the individual believer. But this may be applied corporately and nationally. For instance, it could be argued that the various elective outcomes experienced earlier this week are representative of being further delivered into the power of our iniquities as a nation of people who have turned from the Lord. We were going in that direction. Here you go. You like it so much, there's more of it for you. And believe me, it's probably not going to get better if that's uh, as a result of uh, not having to face elective office again. So the point is, is this unyieldedness to God's will as a principle, these consequences accrue, uh, even nationally. As we know very well, it is God who raises up and puts down leaders. He may do this for blessing, and he may do so for cursing. Now finally, uh, we touched on, relative to unyieldedness, a couple of important implications. First, unyieldedness is a heart condition. It may be present in the life of the believer irrespective of outward appearances or a point of spiritual maturity. So we, an unyielded believer could be someone who doesn't appear to be so, you know, based on outward appearances, because it's a condition of the heart. But wherever it occurs, it is serious, particularly if one persists in it. The factors of hardness of heart and dullness of hearing, which could be seen as callousness to God and insensitivity to His Word, become further and further entrenched. Believers who follow this course of unyieldedness for many years find it tremendously difficult, if not seemingly impossible, to return to a consistent walk with the Lord. And I think we've seen these things tragically occur in the lives of, of believers that we may know. And even the struggles that those believers have in recognizing that they need to turn and the difficulty of, again, in getting to some point of consistency. Okay, so now we'll move ahead. Um, in the short time we had at the end of the last session, we simply introduced the second condition of spirituality, confession of sin. Now, before we get to the technicalities of confession of sin, which we are mostly familiar with, I wanted to establish an important context regarding sin itself because one of the things that can get, get lost with an academic, mechanical focus on confession of sin is an appreciation of sin as an absolute barrier of fellowship with God. Human viewpoint reduces sin to something casual. It is seen as synonymous with a mistake. As a human concept, sin is relative and is a matter among men themselves to sort out. Some mistakes are worse than others. 
And the concept of accountability to God for sin is totally foreign to the human viewpoint thinking, of course. As believers, the degree to which we let this thinking affect our understanding of sin will diminish the sense of the deep spiritual darkness it brings to our life as accompanied by related alienation from God. From the divine viewpoint perspective, sin brings separation from God. Man is, and man is directly accountable to God for it. Sin permeates the entirety of man's existence and as such is a barrier between God and man. Or, I'm sorry, and is such a barrier between God and man that only the death of his own son satisfied him relative to the just requirements for its payment. We don't come close to fully appreciating the scope of this. But we don't want to allow it to be diminished by the influence of human viewpoint. And last time together, we looked at an excerpt of Romans 3 that clearly lays this out for us. So, now I'd like to move on to a consideration of the um, further aspects of this, and I'll show the outline in a second here. Uh, it's a matter of developing a backdrop for confession. I want to develop this concept of sin a bit more. And in doing so, we'll be looking at three areas. Sin as the, of the essence of man, sin as an individual act, and the relationship of confession to yieldedness. Now first, looking at the first category, sin as of the essence of man. When we say man is a sinner, this is what we primarily mean. Man has a sinful nature. Man isn't simply a basically good creature that happens to make mistakes from time to time. Now, if we don't accept the reality of sin as, the, as of the essence of man, we will not properly relate to sin as an individual act, nor properly relate to the depth of the predicament that we are in. And though we may be able to relate the reality of this to experience, it is only the Word of God that lays this out authoritatively and clearly. There are times in which we may fail to appraise ourselves as the, the sinners that we are based on our relative avoidance of certain categories of evil conduct. But Scripture never changes its appraisal of us. Now, we could see this directly and indirectly in many places, but let's turn back to Romans chapter 7. We're going to start in verse 18. Verse 18. For I know that in me, this is Paul, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. For the good that I will to do, I do not do, but the evil I will not to do, that I practice. Now if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, the one who wills to do good. For, for I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So then, with the mind I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh the law of sin. Do we see in our actions the extent to which we in our flesh are characteristically sinful? Do we see in our actions the extent to which we are characteristically sinful? Not Probably not generally. And that's why we can't go with experience. Um, 
But we see this in the Word of God, do we not? The Word of God makes it very clear the extent to which we're sinful. Just catching a couple phrases in this passage alone, Paul says in verse 18, In me that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. Nothing good dwells. Verse 21, Evil is present with me. Verse 24, O wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? Now, we are not directed to confess our general sinfulness, per se, but we must agree with God concerning our nature as sinners, as a backdrop or as a fundamental understanding. Turn to 1 John chapter 1. We're just going to read one verse here to this particular point. Verse one, chapter 1, verse 8. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. In this particular verse, in this context, it's speaking about the sin nature, not specific acts of sin, which we see mentioned in other surrounding verses in this context. So what we see here is if we deny that we have a sin nature, and I take that to cover both the assertions as believers of its being eradicated or made inactive. If we deny that we have an active, real sin nature as believers, we are disagreeing with God to the point of denying His Word. The truth, as is pointed out here, it says, the truth is not in us. So it's important, though we don't confess. Confession isn't a matter of saying, Lord, I confess I'm a sinner. In a sense, we accept that as an underlying truth. We need to understand that. And we need to come to a growing understanding of the depth of the reality of that. It's vitally important that we properly appraise ourselves according to God's Word as wretched sinners. To the extent we do so, on one hand, we are inclined to see sin as God does, a serious matter that brings separation from Him and the consequences that relate to that. And on the other hand, on the positive side, we more fully bask in the fullness of God's grace and we, in that grace, manage our individual sins accordingly. So as we come to see ourselves, the, the degree to which sin, we are wretched sinners, we are able to more clearly see God's grace and live in the light of it and see it as the, the total provision for us. Now, in this importantly, uh, this understanding and this growing understanding importantly puts us in a posture of humility before God and men. Turn to Luke chapter 18, verse 10. Eighteen, verse 10. We're going to read a familiar... Uh, Account the Lord spoke to the Pharisees here, starting in verse 10 to verse 14, I believe. Yeah. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood and prayed with, thus with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector. I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector standing afar off would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now what we see here is an acknowledgement by the tax collector of his utter sinfulness before God, of his recognition of his utter sinfulness. 
Now he may have confessed some specific sin or sins that are not recorded here, but what is recorded is his proper self-appraisal concerning his sin nature and his need of God's mercy accordingly. As we see, this is a vitally important aspect of a walk with the Lord. So, as we move on now to the next category on our list, just we have to understand that just getting a more full and increasing appraisal of ourselves as sinners puts us in a position where we are more able to be yielded properly and confess more precisely uh, our individual acts of sin. And then, all in the realm of an understanding and appreciation of the fullness of God's grace. And secondly, we'll look at sin as an individual act. Now, as sinners, we commit individual acts of sin. It is these acts that we are directed to confess to God. At this point, we don't have to spend a lot of time with this. We understand that we may allow our sin nature to have control in our lives. And when it does, it manifests itself through mental attitude sins. Typically, that's where it starts. Sins of the tongue and overt acts of sin. These are familiar categories to us. Uh, But let's look at one passage, James chapter 1, just to see kind of the dynamic of individual sin. Starting in verse 13. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. So we see here, in this passage, the conscious process by which the believer responds to his old sin nature in a way that yields a specific act of sin leading to death. And this is not the sin unto death as we see in First John, it's temporal death, speaking of loss of fellowship with God, a severance of the fellowship relationship with God is what this death speaks to. Now it is personal or individual acts of sin that are the subject of Scripture's specific directive of confession. And we are going to save a more detailed look for that later. Um, So we see, i.e., 1 John 1, 9, we confess our sins, that's what he is speaking to, the manifestations of the sin nature. Okay, finally, look at the relationship of confession to yieldedness. Can we find a relationship between yieldedness and confession? Though we can define and describe these aspects of spirituality separately, can they function separately? Okay, turn to Exodus chapter 9, verse 25. When I sit through other studies, I frequently get get material for this study, and this happened to come from the Exodus study the pastor is going through on uh, Saturday night. We're going to read 25 through 35, and then some past verses in chapter 10. And the hail struck throughout the whole land, so we're breaking into the plagues here, and this is the case of the plague of the hail. And the hail struck throughout the whole land of Egypt, all that was in the field, both man and beast, And the hail struck every herb of the field and broke every tree of the field. Only in the land of Goshen, where the children of Israel were, there was no hail. And Pharaoh sent and called for Moses and Aaron and said to them, I have sinned this time. The Lord is righteous and my people and I are wicked. Entreat the Lord that there may be no more mighty thundering and hail, for it is enough. I will let you go and you shall stay no longer. So Moses said to him, As soon as I have gone out of the city... 
I will spread out my hands to the Lord. The thunder will cease and there will be no more hail that you may know that the earth is the Lord's. But as for you and your servants, I know that you will not yet fear the Lord God. Now the flax and the barley were struck for the barley was in the head and the flax was in the bud. But the wheat and the spelt were not struck for they were our late crops. So Moses went out of the city from Pharaoh and spread out his hands to the Lord. Then the thunder and the hail ceased and the rain was not poured on the earth. And when Pharaoh saw that the rain, the hail, and the thunder had ceased, he sinned yet more. And he hardened his heart, he and his servants. So the heart of Pharaoh was hard. Neither would he let the children of Israel go as the Lord had spoken by Moses. Uh, Verse 12 of chapter 10. Just to show that we're now on to the next plague here, the plague of the locusts. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locusts, that they may come upon the land of Egypt and eat every herb of the land, all that the hail has left. Now we're going to jump down to 16, uh, skipping some of the details of the results to see Pharaoh's response. Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron in haste and said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin only this once and entreat the Lord your God that he may take away from me this death only. So he went out from Pharaoh and entreated the Lord, and the Lord turned a very strong west wind, which took the locusts away and blew them into the Red Sea. There remained not one locust in all the territory of Egypt, but the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the children of Israel go. Did Pharaoh confess sin? Was his heart yielded to God? No. We understand that Pharaoh was an unbeliever, um, and therefore the direct application to us as believers is not there. But by way of principle, is it possible for the believer to confess sin from an unyielded heart? and, And that's why I think we go back to the fact that yieldedness is the foundation of true spirituality. It is true, a believer can confess sin from an unyielded heart. And this offers us an insight into the weakness of an inordinate focus on confession of sin as the only or at least the primary condition for true spirituality. Turn to Matthew 15, verse 7. Read 7 through 9. Hypocrites, well, this is Christ speaking. Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Again, we're speaking about Pharisees, unbelievers. But in principle, we can see application uh, in the lives of believers as well. Confession may represent an action of the lips, whereas yieldedness is a posture of the heart. The believer may mechanically, or even cavalierly, as some may have recounted from their own experience in observing, confess sin with no real underlying heart desire or intent to turn from that sin. Confession of sin may be reduced to something that occurs habitually or at the prompting of the pastor before the teaching of the word or when one is caught <laughs> in sin. But it is not it could po- in the, it could be possible to be that way and not be characteristic of the life in general because of an unyielded heart toward God. I won't go into any anecdotes about this. Perhaps um, you can derive your own anecdotes from your own personal experience where you are confronted, and at the time you're confronted, you confess sin, but there has not been a change of heart relative to future relationship with that sin. And to that point, let's turn to, in closing, to Proverbs chapter 28.
We'll read verses 13 and 14. Twenty-eight, thirteen, and 14. He who covers his sins will not prosper, but whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Happy is the man who is always reverent, but he who hardens his heart will fall into calamity. I had memorized Proverbs twenty-eight, thirteen long ago, along with many other verses, but I had never seen the, the fuller context when you look at verse 14. And they seem to actually work together to this point. We see here confession coupled with yieldedness. True confession unto spirituality, in other words, fellowship with God, operates off the foundation of yieldedness. And we've we've put this up a few times, but the idea is yieldedness is the foundation and confession It provides the context of the life for confession of sin. Confession of sin, as it has come to be perhaps understood in a vacuum, in a bubble, has been isolated, I think, from this principle in certain ways, uh, or at least it's not been uh, emphasized in balance with yieldedness. Uh, because it's something that is we are regularly reminded of. It becomes almost rote, you know, perhaps when you come to the study of the Word of God. At the point you come to the study of the Word of God, perhaps unyieldedness is a bigger problem to deal with than simply confession. All we can do from the pulpit is say, okay, if you're aware of anything, uh, any unconfessed sin in your lives, you've got to deal with that now. If there's an unyieldedness problem, that's, that perhaps is a bigger problem that, that the Lord might have to work you through as you get challenged from the Word or or divine discipline or whatever. But at any rate, uh, I think this puts it in, in proper context or perspective. And that's where we'll leave it today. Next time we'll move ahead with the more technical portion of the confession of sin. Or, or look at that. And let's uh, look to the Lord in closing now. Father, we pray as we work our way through the word even though not a technical layout of confession per se it it got pretty technical Uh, pray that we would see this as relational well that's what we're really after Father coming to grips with the truth of your word that we might know you uh, and walk with you so we pray to the end that these things would come to the proper application and understanding to that end and again we thank you for our time today and our further time ahead in Jesus name Amen